first of all, um, what stunning readings to come after all three of them? Like, I'm really, I'm really sort of picking myself up after after that experience. I, I think everything, uh, all all three readers performing were really, really great. Um, I'm going to be reading uh, a short little bit of of Unravel a couple of poems from Sam Snarl, and then a couple of poems from a manuscript that is sort of being made at the moment um, that I'm kind of putting the finishing touches to. I think I'm going to screen share as well, um, just to kind of uh, join in. Uh, so let's see if this works. Okay. Um, the first, so Unravel Anch is is kind of like a short story mixed with concrete poems. The concrete poems are sort of part of the short story in that they are, they sort of represent photographs taken by the protagonist. And I'm just going to read the first four pages from that to start with. Oh, that's, that's what it looks like. <laughs> the ice pilot leaves her boat, setting out on foot across the pans. This is north of the circle, north of the spit, beyond the final chapter of land as we know it. No epilogue, no afterword, no postscript. Fast ice, then the flows. Pages and pages of white. She takes with her a sled, a folding field camera, biscuits, tins of pemmican, skis and stove, lamp, collapsible kayak, pick, cocoa. Her course plotted, she walks for three days before unpacking the camera, loading the first plates, exposing them. East Anglia shipwrecks. New Gypsy John Hunter, Raby Vulcan Castle, Speedwell Atalanta, Goodway. These were the Smacksmen salvages from Brightling Sea. They were close to panic. The shock brought them tumbling out. Cat's Cradle, green, earth, blue, white, pearl, the great door of heaven. Ah, whom? I looked up at the sky where the bird had been. It buzzed like bees, it swayed. We all looked up, then at one another. This is the outer membrane of the storm, its stray, surly thrusts, their impression on silver salts in gelatin. These images, when later developed, will prove what the ice pilot already knows. There is a library trapped in the ice. No, not trapped, fused, overlapped, intermaterialized. And for some time, its structural integrity has been weakening. Its edges are being shorn off, slivers of it carried for miles. Words from the same text, she sees, retain a powerful attraction to one another, forming sentences as they settle on the ground. So that's the start of the Ice Pilot story. Can, there are more she sees more, takes more photographs and continues on to try and find the heart of the library, um, which she does sort of by the end of the book. Um, but I'll leave Unravel Anch there and move on to a couple of poems from Sand Snarl. Sand Snarl and Unravel Anch are both set in the same, the same world. Uh, it's a sort of world I'm developing out of poetry, pamphlets and individual poems that I'm probably going to document online as well. But this is a very different part of the world. This is a town uh, this is a town where sand is is sort of everything to the uh, to the residents. It's maybe a town, it's maybe a region, it's maybe a village. It's not entirely clear. So I'm going to read a couple of poems from that pamphlet. The first of which is a sort of account of how things came to be the way they are in Sand Snarl. And this is called the Thula of Sand, whose mouth hovers eternally above a cup of mead, orates the beginnings of the age of sand. 
Before there was a now, there was a jar. The jar contained a sandstorm, an infinitude of sand that twined and tore, intensely muscular and infinitely busy in the enterprise of sand. It lingered in a storeroom on a lip of shelf behind some milk crates, a small and secret thing, till someone missed their step or lost their grip, delivering a tremor that impelled a teetering. The floor came up and what was in that jar went reeling and unreeling over all that ever was. Sand, not gravel, clay or silty tar, no hogging, pebble, cobble, soil or granite dust for us. Every road and jitty, copse and field, squares and public gardens, all were avalanched in sand. The breweries were jammed, the ponds were filled, the market stalls and fairs dishevelled, overrun with sand. In houses, as in churches and hotels, in teacups, as in ovens, as in pantries, drifts of sand. We drank and cooked amongst its particles. We suffered it, we slept with it, we breathed and bathed in sand. It blowed and scurried through our ears, our heads, uncovering the whole of us, then hiding it again. Sand amid our folds, our fresh bread bedspreads, its fingers on our decks, doing its shuffle hurricane. It blurred our plans, it blurred the names on stones. The border between sand and dream became a spit of sand. It choked our clocks, it doped our pheromones. Every book we owned became miscellany of sand. And now we mine the sand beneath the sand, we shovel sand, we feed it into furnaces of sand. I, we pray for sand and lay the blame on sand. I call my daughter sand. I call my other daughter sand. One more from that, from a shorter one from, from Sand Snarl. All the characters in Sand Snarl are wrapped up in, in each other in different ways. This is called, um, the roboteer hesitates on the cusp before easing herself at last into the cab of her golem. Have you seen any anime? It's kind of like that where, where pilots drive robot suits. This is what I'm imagining here. Gently quaking, her flight suit a half sloughed snakeskin, she sinks amid cables and instrumentation. This is her girl, this poor machine, once agile, whose radiator now begins to gurgle. Sand in the intakes, sand in the joins of panels and joysticks, crackling as she runs preliminary diagnostics. Then each raises the other's stiff engine from its stasis. Her fingers dance across gamuts of indicators. Heat and a hum to hold the pair in equilibrium. She wears her summoned sweat like healing balm. Okay, and to finish with a couple of newer poems, I literally sort of finished the draft of this yesterday. So it might change between this reading and any future ones you hear. It's, it's provisionally titled, but not so roughly fumbled as it could have been. Uh, and the names of the characters are censored, so I'm just going to like leave a space of silence when I say them. The box appears downstairs one night, addressed to Lord and Lady. What's stowed inside, ensconced in velvet plush, is some sort of device or artifact, some kind of art, some stem of sparkling nothing. It doesn't suit the fireplace in the drawing room. It doesn't suit the armament collection. It disagrees with every door's lunette. While Lord, engrossed in his manage, Lady spirits it to her boudoir but finds it unconsoling, disappointing. 
Lord polishes the hope, its surface can be peeled, and out will dance a juiced homunculina, jazzy as a dragonfly with dew-bead breasts. Alas, he cannot find a switch or latch. They theorize it might respond to changes in barometric pressure, time of year. What if magnets could draw forth its speech, a certain note, pneumatic currents? Suppose somewhere within it, there's an hourglass. They pamper their thin notions, rub glossy oil into their ignorance. Lord sits late with his guests, bleared with sherry, thinking more and more of burying or burning it, sucks on his goblet. Lady rarely strays far from it. She sets it on the dresser and digs into her novel, strokes an eyelid, startles. What she took for a moth was the shadow of the page turning. The thing sits and it does not glow. It does not ripen, it does not emit a signal, it does not lie in wait. And the last thing I wanted to read today, this is a bit of an experiment. This is a poem written partly as a sort of like a, a board game, the kind of very simple board game you would play with a dice. So I'm gonna read it rolling the dice from the start and I only read the lines that I end up on um, through the dice rolls. It starts with, a, it's called a labyrinth and it starts with, uh, an epigraph from uh, Charles Cotton's The Complete Gamester. Uh, I know no, not what instructions to give you. You must herein trust to your own judgment and the chance of the dice. I've got a dice uh, here, uh, uh, an electronic dice. So it's, it goes, cave, your flesh is bunched up, barbled. Two, you are the inside of a death mask. Three, one, two, three. You wring the neck of the match flame. Move forward three spaces. Spiracle, foramen, duct, vent. Five. Tumbled wishing coins. You are the cooling slag that never cools. Your old tongue cave, fungal, self fumigating. Roll again. Even you do not know your skullsy secret. You are encrusted with the things you eat. Pocket, sulcus, druse, os. Did the last three. Dance down your steps, your ankles, your denticles. Dance across your mouth parts. Dance. Okay, thank you very much. Hand back to uh, Helen.